Veteran sports journalist and television commentator David Aldrich joins us to discuss his move to The Athletic as editor-in-chief and his love for his hometown and the D.C. sports scene. Coming up right now on The Rock Newman Show. Welcome to The Rock Newman Show from the campus of historic Howard University located in Washington, D.C. It is my desire to inspire you with personal stories of extraordinary achievement. My guest today is a young man born right here at Freedman's Hospital, which is now Howard University Hospital. He attended elementary and junior high school in Washington, D.C., DeMatha High School in Maryland, and is a graduate of American University. And although he spent most of his career traveling the country as a sports journalist and television commentator. He has always made his home in Washington, D.C. He says both the city and its sports teams hold a special place in his heart. Joining me now is David Aldrich, the new editor-in-chief of The Athletic. Thank you so much for joining oh, us my pleasure, here today Rock. on The Rock Newman Show. Thank you, Rock. My All pleasure. Right. Thank you for having me. So, man, this is some exciting news uh, yeah. we have mm -hmm. that in uh, just a little, uh, I think we're looking at about 10 days. Yeah, a couple weeks. You are going to make an official start. You're once again making a break from yeah. your current vocation. Yeah. Or your current job. Yeah. At <laughs> TNT. Mm-hmm. And you're going to take over as editor in chief of the Atlantic Athletic, yeah. A the the Atl the Athletic DC. Yeah. Tell us what the uh, the Athletic DC is. Well, look, it's and what a, it's going to be. Well, it's a um, you know these uh, two uh, mil billionaires, right? Started this a couple years ago. Um, they wanted to start sports websites around the country. Um, currently, they're in I think it's 40 cities. Uh, or areas of the U.S. and Canada, basically every major city in the United States, plus Toronto and Montreal. Um, and in each one of those cities, they've hired, put staffs together to cover teams in those cities. Um, mm -hmm. So in D.C., we have websites up already, um, The Athletic D.C. If you go to theathletic.com, you'll see the drop-down menu. It shows you all the cities that we're in. Right. So you just click on Washington, D.C., and it, show, it takes you to the page, and it's all the teams in the area. We, we're in the process of hiring people to cover all the teams in the area. We've got the football team covered. Um, we, will have, we will have the Wizards covered in a few weeks, I hope. Mm -hmm. um, the Caps, we've hired a, a guy to start covering them immediately. And um, we're, we're talking to people about the Mystics. Which the Nationals will get it done. It's hard to do the Nationals because they're in season. Yeah. So a lot of the people that we would like to talk to are covering them right now. So uh -huh. it's, uh, it's hard to get them uh, to stop covering them, I, which we understand. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's basically just, if you want to know about Washington sports, you go to theathletic.com. And, and it's an online, yeah. public, uh, straight up online it's publication. Online, it's online, it's all digital. Uh, there's, the great thing is that there's no ads, no pop-up ads. You click on it, you don't have to take a quiz. You click on it, you don't have to uh, answer a question. You click on it, you don't get sent to some you know, a website that you didn't want to go to, you get the story that you clicked on. You know what, David, that's very interesting you say that. And I want to ask you, I don't want to necessarily, you know, get so much in the weeds yeah, at yeah. all. Sure. But the viewer, the reader, yeah. not seeing any ads, yeah. what's the business model, how to stay in business? Subscriptions. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's all subscriber-based. All, subscri subscriber all of it. It's $5 a month, and if you click on it, you, there are ways to get it for less, for a 30% discount. Uh -huh. um, if you go to theathletic.com, again, click on it. There's some specials that, that they are introducing for people who are just signing up. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's, what, that's the model, is we think uh, that people will pay $5 a month, which is one less trip to Starbucks per month, uh -huh. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, for good coverage. And mm -hmm. you don't just get D.C. That's the thing. Like, right. if, you, 
if you subscribe, you not only get the D.C. coverage, you get every city. You get all 40. Uh -huh. Plus, you get the national coverage that we have on baseball and football and basketball, college basketball. So it's really, from a value standpoint, you can't do better. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw a quote um, uh, of yours where you're saying, hey, you have no ax to grind with the Washington Post, nope. and, mm -hmm. and what, what you guys are doing is not looking to try to put the Washington Post um, out of business. Yeah. So if one asks the question of who's your competitor, is it the undefeated? Well, to a certain degree, yes, mm -hmm. uh, but it's also the Post. It's, you know, there's, there's other websites in town that, that cover D.C. sports. Um, but my point on that was simply, look, I love the Post. I worked there for nine years. They hired me when I was 22 years old. Right. They put me in a position to do things that I never thought I would get to do. Uh, so I will always love that paper. Uh, but I don't think any paper, as I said, I don't think any paper can't stand a little competition. Right. That's all. Sure, sure. You know, any publication can stand a little competition. So we're going to compete. Yeah. You know, we're going to, we hire good people. We expect to break stories. We expect to be um, the place where people go to read, not just um, the scores, because they get that already. Mm -hmm. We want to provide some in-depth coverage. Because um, nowadays, Rock, you know, Five minutes after the game, everybody knows who won, yeah. so, and they've probably seen the highlights right, already. Sure. So we're not, you can't just write a game story anymore. You have yeah. to provide something beyond the game story. What am I paying, what am I getting for my $5 a month? Sure. Well, I think if you go to The Athletic, you're going to see some good in-depth reporting from people that know the teams mm -hmm. and know what the stories are and how to get them out. Mm -hmm. Okay, we just mentioned the Washington Post a couple of times. Yeah, I got a couple of names I want to ask you about. Sure. Uh, get get some get some thoughts and some reflections. Okay. George Solomon. George hired me. You know, so I'm always going to be grateful to George. He had no reason to hire me at 22 years old. Mm -hmm. None. He could have. It's the Washington Post. They pick who works there. They sure. don't. Sure. You know. Now, and you had just come from American University. I had. Yeah. You were the editor. I was the editor of the paper my junior year, <clears throat> and then my senior year. Um, I actually had a friend of mine who, who I went to AU with who was on the, the desk at the Post. Right. And Mike Trilling, who you probably remember, yes. Mike was the, was the high school sports editor there, and he was an mm -hmm. AU grad. Mm -hmm. That was what year? That was 19, well, this would have been 1986. Okay, okay. So um, he would hire, he would bring in AU kids. He uh -huh. would hire AU kids to cover high schools, basically. Uh -huh. So he said, come on down, cover some high school football, see if you like it, see if we like you, which yeah. I did for a year. I did, sport, I did basketball and football mainly. Um, they had an internship, which I applied for and got. So I was able to work there after I graduated all summer. So I basically covered the Orioles all summer. Mm -hmm. um, and then I thought, I was, when the internship was over, I thought I was going to have to leave. But they had a what they call a general assignment job, which is you, whatever comes up, right. you cover it. Mm -hmm. And they and George offered it to me. You know, And again, that's why I'll be grateful for whatever reason he saw something in me yeah. and was willing to take a chance on it and and I and if you look and I've always said this about George if you look at his staff in 1986 87 yeah it looked real different from everybody else's staff yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know you had Don Huff on high schools you had Anthony Cotton there covering the bullets you had yeah. Mike Wilbon there covering Maryland college basketball you had yeah. me yeah you had Christine Brennan covering the football yeah. team I mean just it was just George didn't need a he didn't need a focus group to tell him diversity was yeah. important. You know what? Uh, I, I bring up his name because, you know, George, I, I had some real debates with sure. George. Some, so did I. Some, 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 <laughs> some, some screaming matches so with him. So did I. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, man. When, you, when one looks back over the history yeah. of the sports sec well, the whole paper, but yeah. the sports section of the Washington Post, right. and look at the giants who have come out of there yeah. who came, who worked under George who George brought in yeah. and what certainly appeared to be his sense of wanting to create real diversity yeah. a whole lot of people talk about diversity in all aspects of life right. including sports and they give it lip service that's right George made hires Hire of individuals right. who were absolutely integrated the paper and they were prominent in their positions yeah yeah I, rem I, I remember we were talking um, before we came on here but when when David Dupree was with right them, 
Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this was not, it wasn't a one-off. It wasn't, okay, I'm done with diversity now. I'm just yeah. going to hire some more white guys. No, he just kept, he's, he kept after me. He hired Mike Freeman. He hired Jay Adande. Yeah. You know, he hired Rachel Nichols. I mean, all these people that have come through that have gone on to do great things in journalism. Um, he hired them. Yeah. And at a young age, not when we were established and people knew who we were, when we didn't have nothing. Yeah. When we didn't know yeah. who, if we were any good. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want, Lord knows I don't want to give him too, too much, much love. Too much credit, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, but one would have to surmise that he didn't just hire people willy-nilly. He right. had a, 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 he had a, an eye for, he, he really had an eye for talent. Yeah, there weren't too many mistakes. Yeah. If you look at the track record. Yeah, and that, uh, that talent attracted just readership, man. Yeah. And, and the talent, as I said, has gone on, you know, to big things. Yeah. To wit, Michael Wilbon. Well, yep. Mike is a mentor of mine. I mean, you know, I came there and Michael was still covering, at the time he was covering the NFL, um, he had not gotten the column yet. He was a, a reporter still, national reporter covering football. But, you know, Mike took me under his wing. He gave me advice, talked me off a few ledges when I wanted to go cuss George out, <laughs> um, and was a big brother to me, yeah. you know, and, and really helped me out a lot when I was starting the business, learning how to be a reporter, um, introduced me to a lot of people, mm -hmm. um, and really paid it forward. And I'll always, again, be grateful to Mike for that. I mean, he helped me out a lot yeah. and a lot of other young reporters who needed somebody to look up to, someone to emulate, yeah. right? You know, somebody who looked like me, yeah. right? And yeah. you didn't see, even in 19, even then, if you leave the newsroom, you didn't see too many people look like you in the, in the sport, in the press box. Yeah, sure. So Mike was one of the few people that looked like me and Bill Roden was another one at the yeah. New York Times who had no reason to, to put an arm around me, but mm -hmm. did and mm -hmm. gave me advice and you know, told me to do that, look out for this, and you know, was really wise beyond his years. So people like that really were helpful. So to the an aspiring journalist who's watching yeah. here, here tonight, you just said Wilbon talked you off a couple ledges when you were getting ready to go cuss Solomon. <laughs> uh, so you were the writer. Yeah. He was the editor. Yeah. To that aspiring journalist, share why there is that kind of debate that goes on between the writer and the editor. Well, you always, when you're covering a team, after a while, if, you know, you kind of figure, you, you know what's going on with a team. Mm -hmm. And so you know what the story is, you know what, how to write it or how to report it. Uh, sometimes your editor has a different view, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And since they're the boss, you have to, you have to do what they say, or, mm -hmm. you know, or you could quit, you know? <laughs> but. Mm -hmm. um, so you have these conflicts mm -hmm. about doing this, doing that. Mm -hmm. I would get angry. I mean, I'm not tooting my own horn. I was pretty good on the beat now. I didn't mm -hmm. get beat too often now. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, maybe once or twice a year. And George mm -hmm. would be furious with me. And I would be like, George, I broke 17 stories mm -hmm. in a row. Mm -hmm. So things like that would come up. Uh -huh. Days off. Mm -hmm. I worked 38 days in a row. I need mm -hmm. a day off. Mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So um, all the things that come up between between employee employers, yeah. the same stuff. So what stands out, you say broke stories. You, yeah. know, you, 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 you were on the beat. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. when you're on the beat, your job is to be first. That's right. So, mm -hmm. uh, so George's position then was, yeah, you, you just did 17, you but you didn't get, get 18. Never get beat. You got to get them on. You can never get beat. Right. That was his philosophy. So mm -hmm. as, you, as you reflect back to those what are now earlier times, yeah. what's a couple of standout uh, when you were first? What's, what's a couple of things you scooped first oh, that stands out? Well, I mean, when I was covering the bullets, I mean, remember Bernard King and Wes Unsell got into a fight and Bernard basically threatened to shoot him? <laughs> because anybody that would get a, get a fight with Wes with Unsell, Unsell exactly. Crazy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, 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 right. Exactly. So, you know, draft picks, you know, getting the draft picks first. Um, when I was covering the football team, it was, you know, Mark Rippon getting cut. You know, things like that, um, mm -hmm. um, these, all kinds. I mean, it's hard and, to remember and, back then. Sure, sure. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and, and, but, and, and that comes, again, covering yeah. and then building relationships, That's building right. trust. That's right. Having your resources, having yeah. your sources. People, te people trusting you, basically, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, and s saying, you know, don't quote me, but this is happening or that's happened, you mm -hmm. know. 
And so that, that comes with time. It yeah. comes with people. You have to build relationships with people to the point where they feel comfortable telling you things they're not supposed to tell you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the beat writer's job. So you went to DeMatha High School. I did. And another journalistic giant went to DeMatha High School. His name is James Brown. JB, yeah. Your thoughts? Well, JB is another guy. Now, I didn't have the day-to-day -day relationship with JB that mm -hmm. I had with Wilbon and some of the others. Mm -hmm. But obviously, when you see somebody rise through the ranks from doing, he was the analyst on the Bullets when I first started yeah. seeing him on TV. After he left Xerox. After he left Xerox. <laughs> right, that's right. That's right. 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 Um, and then became a sideline reporter, then became an anchor, then became an anchor on the evening news, and then has, you know, he's just built this real, you know what you're getting when you get JB on the story. Yeah. You're getting class, you're getting integrity, all of those things, and that's what I look at when I see him. So the times I have seen him, I've told him how much I appreciate the the example he set for me and for other people about how to handle your business. Mm. And you never hear nothing about JB off the, off the air. There's no yeah. scandal. There's no nothing, yeah. you know, because he lives his life the right way. So yeah. um, just a real role model for me, again, as a young person growing up, and when you find out, oh, he went to DeMatha too? Oh, yeah. he's from here too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, and I talk, uh, just a quick aside, that's what, uh, that's what Jim Vance meant to me growing up. Mm -hmm as a young black man in D.C. Mm -hmm. And you turn on the TV and see somebody that looks like you every night mm -hmm. doing the news. Mm -hmm. and Professional. Yeah. And maybe the coolest yes. man on the planet. I remember one time I saw, I saw Vance over at Tacoma Station at the yeah. Jazz Club. Yeah. And I had to be like 35 years old then. <laughs> and I was like, oh, God, God, God. <laughs> over there. Yeah. he was the coolest dude in the room yeah, every time. Right. All, the time. <laughs> All, All the time. All the time. <laughs> yeah. I asked you about James Brown because I did something this morning at about 5 o'clock. Yeah. Anybody that knows James Brown knows that he's up and praying and yeah. doing his thing yeah. early in the morning. So I sent him a text. I said, I got David, got David Aldridge on today. Yeah. I said, any nuggets I need <laughs> to know? I'm, I'm, I'm looking for something I can <laughs> stick in you know, Anything. And here's what he wrote back. Okay. Mm -hmm. I certainly know David, but not exceedingly well. Mm -hmm. My overarching thought that comes to mind about him is a man of integrity and character. That his broadcast reporting efforts have always been about accuracy, honesty, getting at and reporting the truth versus trying to make the story about him or the promotion of his brand. Mm -hmm. His brand is transparency and an unambiguous relaying of issues such that people trust him, particularly, particularly when reporting on controversial topics or in politically charged time. Yeah. Wow. wow. That's what JB. That's wow. what JB texted me back this that's morning. Amazing. I thought I'd share that with you, <laughs> Thank man. Thank you. Well, that's amazing. That's, that's that, so that, very that, nice that, of you that, to say that's that. That's a testament coming from JB. That is. That's it a that's is. a hell of a testimony. It certainly is. Yes. I appreciate that. So we are here in 2018. Right. Three years after you were born, um, I remember watching uh, Tommy Smith sure. and John Carlos. Mm -hmm at the Olympics in 1968 yeah. in Mexico. With the fish, sure. Giving the Black Power salute. Sure. That was obviously politicizing the Olympics, politicizing sports. Sure. Fast forward 50 years. They stood and held the fist. Kaepernick and Kneel. players in the NFL are kneeling, yeah. politicizing sports. Sure. There are those voices that say they don't mix, <laughs> and you say? Uh, I say sports and politics have always mixed. What, what is a ban on black players in baseball but a political stance? It is a political, that's a political stance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is, if you go back and look at the anthem, because I was very curious about this, because people kept saying, well, they're protesting the anthem, even though they weren't, <laughs> and they aren't. But if you look at the anthem and you look at Francis Scott Key, the guy who wrote the anthem, yeah. and you look at his stances politically in the 1800s as someone who defended the rights of slave owners to take their slaves back, <laughs> and if you look at the, all the verses of the anthem. And the third, the, especially that especially third, the third of the anthem. That's right, when he talks about 
slaves who were fighting on the side of the British mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the War of 1812, mm -hmm. and how they were wrong to do that. Yeah. That's political. And they would not be spared. <laughs> That's right. The brutality. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. political. Mm -hmm. So the NFL does nothing but wrap itself in politics with its embrace of, of not only the armed forces, but one version of the armed forces. You don't hear about the veterans who support Kaepernick and the veterans who support the other players who are kneeling because they know that's what they fought for, the right of people to protest mm -hmm. those con conditions that they do not agree with and that they feel are hurting their people. Mm -hmm. The whole point of him kneeling came from a Green Beret who was a former NFL player mm -hmm. who said you shouldn't sit during the anthem. Mm -hmm. Kneeling is a sign of respect for the troops because that's what troops do when someone, one of their own is wounded or killed in action, they kneel. Mm -hmm. When they go to the gravesite, they kneel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So sports has always been political. Mm -hmm. It's just you don't agree with this particular political stance mm -hmm. that these players are taking. Mm -hmm. And so today you burn your Nikes. Right, but yeah. you already paid for them. There you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, your thought about Nike really doubling down on the side of what Kaepernick right. was doing. And of course, they're, they're accused of co co crass commercialism. Well, that's, a, that, that's, an, that's an accusation. Yeah, I mean, I would say this. I'm not, I don't hold Nike. I don't think Nike is the uber villain. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're the bastion of virtue either. They're trying to sell some shoes, all right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they can sell some shoes to young people who are down with Kaepernick, yeah. who feel like Kaepernick represents their point of view. That's fine. Mm -hmm. They didn't have to do it, though. Right. They could have right. still sold, sold a lot of shoes and not taken this stance. Mm -hmm. So I give them credit for that, mm -hmm. for saying we're going to be on, we want to be on the right side of history. Mm -hmm and sell some shoes, <laughs> so mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> you can, mm -hmm. both things can be true at the same time. Mm -hmm. And the gentleman, let me use another word, ah. the individual, yes. down at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, mm -hmm. his foray yeah. into an area of which you've covered now forever. Yeah. Your thoughts about Donald Trump. Well, that's just, you know, it's, look, he's appealing to his base in a very kind of venal and crass way, as he does with just about everything that he touches. Um, you know, I am somewhat moved by the notion that this is a guy who couldn't get into the NFL. They wouldn't let him in the NFL. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't you or me rejecting him. It was people who looked like him, who had money like him, right. who said, Nah, <laughs> yeah, right. we don't want you in the club. Yeah, and so I think he's always kind of had it in for them as a result of that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's an easy argument when you appeal to the base nature of mm -hmm. some people who are who want to be appealed to in that manner, and who want to react in that manner. Don't want to give any thought to the issue. Don't want to accept the fact that maybe there are people who disagree with them on legitimate grounds, mm -hmm. and wrap it in patriotism, flag, anthem, all that stuff that nobody is even protesting. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not surprised by it because this is what this guy's always done. Mm -hmm. um, I still believe that the greatest running back in the history of NFL is James Nathaniel Brown. I agree. <laughs> um, he's been quoted as saying, talking, looking, talking about Kaepernick, and yeah. that uh, Kaepernick uh, shouldn't get paid or shouldn't, uh, have commercial yeah. benefits as a result of his taking a stance on uh, social justice or human rights. Yeah, well, I disagree with Jim on that. And I don't know how he came to that conclusion, but I would disagree with him. As much as I respect Jim Brown mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, you know, I just disagree with him on that. I mean, I think I'm pretty sure the First Amendment hasn't been revoked yet. Right. <laughs> so, right. Right. Um, you know, the fact that Colin Kaepernick is taking a knee and other players are taking a knee or raising a fist during the playing of the anthem, which nobody pays any attention to. And if you've ever been to a football game, all these people who are complaining about these, this kneeling, mm. I don't see them exactly standing at attention with their hands over their hearts most of the time. Right. <laughs> when the anthem's being played, they're usually getting their second or third beer at mm -hmm. that point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I think there's a certain amount of hypocrisy Mm -hmm. And I think, again, it's people who want to have that political point of view mm -hmm. who find a way to 
support that point of view. And I would, again, with all due respect to Jim Brown, who I respect for, you know, in so many ways sure. for what he did when the heat and the light was on him the most, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just disagree with him on this one. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, staying, you know, in the political arena for a minute, so whether it was the Golden State Warriors yeah. or many other uh, now championship teams right. who have refused to go to the White House. Yeah. Again, politics, sure. sports, sure. sports, politics. Yeah. Any thoughts on, you know, whether they have an obligation, any criticism that they don't or, or, or applauding that they, that they t take that stand? You know, I'm, I'm always, I will always support anyone's political point of view as long as it doesn't injure other people mm -hmm. with the application of that point of view. Mm -hmm. So if the guy, what's his name, Tim Thomas, who was the goal, I think his name is Tim Thomas, the goaltender in Boston with the Bruins when they won, he didn't want to, he didn't want to go to the White House because Obama was president. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're entitled to do that. Mm -hmm. So these players are entitled to do that too. They're yeah. entitled not to go if they don't want to go um, for whatever reason. They're not obligated to go. It's a photo op anyway. I mean, I was at when the Warriors uh, won the first time, I think. I went to the ceremony with Obama. It's mm -hmm. a photo op, mm -hmm. you know, and all the, mm -hmm. everybody wants their picture taken with the president or with Nancy Pelosi or with Steph Curry or whoever it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's okay, you yeah. know, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. And it's not, going or not going is, isn't going to affect the republic in any meaningful way. So, you know, to each his own. Mm -hmm. uh, you say everybody likes to get pictures taken with the president. Sure. You got yours taken. I did. You got, <laughs> you got yours taken with the president. I did. What was that exchange like? It was weird. Because <laughs> I wasn't expecting to interview him. We knew he was coming to the game. But the idea, the original idea was he would come down and sit at the table with Kevin Harlan and Reggie Miller who were calling the game. And I was the sideline reporter. Mm -hmm. But I guess the Secret Service looked at the setup and said they didn't, they didn't feel comfortable with that setup. Okay. They would feel more comfortable if he was in an area that they could kind of control. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that that meant he would be in an area near me. Mm -hmm. So they said, you know, do you want to interview him? And I said, yeah, <laughs> of course I want to interview oh, him. Also yeah. meant you were a lucky son. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, and right. it was great. Yeah. The thing, I'll, you know what was cool about it was that it wasn't like talking to the president. It was talking. Mm. It was like talking to a guy who really likes and follows sports. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You could just yeah. tell he's yeah. like paying, he pays attention to it. Like mm -hmm. he had, the question, the things he was saying were the things that people who were paying attention would say about, mm -hmm. in this case, the Bulls, the team that he liked, mm -hmm. but about the NBA in general. It wasn't mm -hmm. just... Joe fan, mm -hmm. like most, I, I should say, I think most presidents don't mm -hmm. really know sports that well, but Obama mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, 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 which is demonstrated in him filling out his yeah. brackets and, and giving his justification attention. for yeah. why yeah. and all and all the rest. Um, let me ask you, going back to the athletic for a moment. Sure. There is so much being made of. The incident at the U.S. Open mm. with Serena Williams right. and, and, and the umpire. Yeah. And the thought that what Serena did, I don't want to call it, you know, aggressive, overly aggressive, unsportsmanlike, yeah. whatever. Yeah. But in comparison, you juxtapose what she did right. with the McEnroes sure. and the Ilan Nastasis right. and so many other of the male competitors yeah. that it it, it, it it paled in comparison. No question. Yet she was, you know, more harshly uh, penalized mm -hmm. than anyone. So talk to us about that intersection, man, of you got, again, still predominantly male figures. Yeah. Officiating, overseeing, you know, yeah. the sport yeah. with women participating and that Again, that intersection yeah. of male mindset, mm -hmm. because at the risk of making this an overly long question, yeah. it was obvious that the little guy mm -hmm. sitting mm -hmm. up there yeah. was little-minded at that point, and as opposed to de-escalating took offense mm -hmm. at being challenged by this strong black woman. There's no doubt in my mind, again, 
two things, three things, multiple things can be true at the same time. Did she go at him hard? Yes. Um, was she, did she not stop? No, she didn't. She kept going in on him. But my experience over 30 years of covering sports is that the really good referees, the really good officials know how to, your point, de-escalate a situation where whoever's yelling at them and whatever they're saying, you say, I've heard you. I've listened to what you've had to say. Now you need to stop or I'm going to bang you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to tee you up or I'm going to throw you out. I'm going to do whatever it is that, that mm -hmm. referees and umpires can do. Mm -hmm. He didn't do that. And so I think there was definitely, in my mind, um, a paternalistic kind of approach. How dare you mm -hmm. talk to me in that manner? Mm -hmm. Now, part of that, I think, is just kind of the nature of tennis, I think. Mm -hmm. But I, there's no question to me that part of it was misogynistic. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to let this woman yell at me, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And the fact that she's not cursing or not, you know, you know I'm saying it doesn't matter. Right. She's not going to talk to me like that. Mm -hmm. So I think there's no question in my mind that that was part of his reaction. If he had just said, knock it off, Serena, I've yeah. heard you, or Ms. Right. Williams, knock it off, Ms. Williams, I've right. heard you, right. you need to stop, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wouldn't have happened, wouldn't mm -hmm. have gone that way. And to, and, and to me, the comparisons mm -hmm. to Macro and all that don't make any, that, none of that matters. He, put, he, he ended the match, essentially, yeah. by doing yeah. what he did. Yeah. That's what was offensive to me, mm -hmm. was she was probably going to get beat anyway. Yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah, Naomi yeah, yeah. played great. Yeah. yeah, so there was so much taken away yeah, from Naomi. Yeah, Naomi, Naomi played great, yeah. and she was probably going to win anyway. Mm -hmm. But let her win the match. Mm -hmm. Don't give her the match. Mm -hmm. It was what she did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what, as someone who has done this now, from so, so, so 22, so you've done 22 this. 22 years in TV, yeah, yeah 31 done, years. I was going to say, you've done this. <laughs> you've covered sports now for more than 30 years. Yeah. Can you look back and share with us a couple of times where you're supposed to be that disp dispassionate observer? Oh, sure. But you're human. Oh, sure. Some of the most, couple of, few of the most exciting moments of your coverage of sports, no sure. matter what the sport was. Sure. No, I mean, there was, there's, there's been a few. I mean, I always go, I mean, one of the, you know, if you covered, basketball in the 90s and you got to go cover the dream team yeah. in Spain in the yeah. Olympics that was to me the highlight of my career uh-huh um, does that mean does that mean that basketball is more near and dear yes. than anything else to me yes okay okay so I, love, I love so, basketball uh -huh. and I say that as someone who couldn't play it at all yeah okay <laughs> okay okay but I appreciate Everything about basketball appeals to me. It's the athleticism, number one, but it's also the, um, the improvisational skill. Mm -hmm. I, I always feel like I see something new every night. Somebody mm -hmm. does something that I've never seen before. Mm -hmm. The fact that they're not wearing helmets, they're yeah. not padded up, yeah. you can see them. Fully exposed. Yeah. yeah, so you see all the emotion and all the energy and all the passion and all those things. Mm -hmm. and at least until recently, our seats were pretty close. So you get to see it all up front, right? right so, I right. mean, it's all of that appealed to me and made it just a great game to cover. And then the fact, I mean, candidly, the fact that you see people of color excelling at the highest levels mm -hmm. is something that is always going to be close to me. Mm -hmm. And to see Michael Jordan in his prime, yeah. you know, I just don't know how much better it could be for someone who covers sports, mm -hmm. you know? It mm -hmm. would be like seeing Ali in his prime. Mm -hmm. I didn't get to see Ali in his prime. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I would imagine Ali 65 to 67, you just are like, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just just unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. It was like that, I'm yeah. sure, right? Yeah. Yeah. We're like watching Jackie Robinson in his prime, yeah. right? You know, yeah. so yeah. so I got to see that. And, and it's part of the dream team and everything that they meant to basketball around the world. Mm -hmm. That was mm -hmm. really the catalyst for basketball becoming a global sport mm -hmm. because all of the kids that were growing up in Europe and Africa and South America that saw those saw that team play, they were like, wow, we could do that. Mm -hmm. I could do that. And so now you see this explosion in the, in the NBA as a global sport. So that to me was like the most exciting thing I, get, I got to cover. Um, in my career, but I mean, I've got, look, I've covered World Series, I've yeah. covered Super Bowls, yeah. covered the Indy 500, I yeah. mean, I, 
you know, I've had a, a chance to cover a lot of great events. Okay, so you bring up you bring up Michael Jordan. Yeah. And you know, in 2018, inevitably. Yeah. And 14 and 15 and 16. Yeah. There is the comparison and the contrast. A, who is the greatest of all time? Right. Um, that's a wonderful conversation in, in, in the barbershop. In a bar. Yeah, man. So a few weeks ago in the barbershop, yeah. that came up as the debate between them. Yeah. And I was much older than the other folks who were sitting there. Yeah. And I said, well, I could really muddy this conversation, you know. Oh, what, 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 what you mean, OG? <laughs> and mm -hmm. I was like, you re remember a guy by the name of Wilt? <laughs> Chamberlain. Yes, right. <laughs> Remember a guy by the name of Kareem Abdul Abdul Jabbar, yeah. who still has scored still number one thousands of points more yeah. than anyone else, and a guy. And well, no, but Jordan got six rings. That's Bill Russell. He's got too many rings, not e enough fingers. E eleven. <laughs> e eleven. You care to take a stab at that? How do you answer that question? I think it's impossible to uh -huh. answer. The reason why it's impossible to answer is that each one of those players played in a completely different era than the other players played in. Uh -huh. You know, Russell and Chamberlain played in an era where there were eight teams, uh -huh. right? So in some ways it was easier because uh -huh. it wasn't as much competition, but in some ways it was harder because every team had three all-stars on it. Yeah. So. But, and the rules were completely different. The travel was completely different. Jordan played in an era where you could hand check, where you could use your, where you could move guys out of the paint, where you could bump cutters, all those things that mm -hmm. you can't do now. Where, where Rick Mahorn was able to play and not go to jail. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So it was a completely different era. You, yeah. I always tell people, you have to tell me the rules first. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. rules are we playing under? Mm -hmm. We're playing under... 60s rules, we playing under 80s rules, we playing mm -hmm. under the rules now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so those are three completely different games. Mm -hmm. Like Steph Curry couldn't play back then, not because he's not great, yeah. but because he would get beat up so physically he mm -hmm. wouldn't be able to, to, mm -hmm. st to sustain himself. Mm -hmm. So I can't answer it. Yeah. You know, I think Jordan, Jordan was the best player I ever saw. Mm -hmm. I didn't see Wilt in person. Mm -hmm. So I can't say if he's better. I mm -hmm. don't know. I didn't get to see him in person. Mm -hmm. If I had seen him in person, if I would seen Oscar in person, mm -hmm. if I had seen Russell in person, I could give you a better answer. You could probably give a better answer than I could on mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But you did see, you have seen LeBron. Absolutely. And so compare the two. Well, I mean, LeBron is a great, great player. Cerebral, tough, smart. Um, unselfish. I just don't think he or any player in this era has the will that Michael Jordan displayed. To me, mm -hmm. what made Jordan the best player I ever saw was his will. Mm -hmm. He was not going to let you beat him mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. You know, so call that ego, call that yeah, pride, whatever, call no, that I mean, whatever, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. He had more of it than most people. Mm -hmm. You know, and so. His, his ability to, to demand more out of his teammates and, and make them play better than they would play otherwise, to mm -hmm. me, makes him a cut above everybody who's playing now. Mm -hmm. you know, does that mean if they play one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. LeBron, LeBron would probably beat him because he's bigger, mm -hmm. but he might not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. you, you know, man, I, 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 I'm going to take the liberty to do this here mm -hmm. in terms of um, Jordan's greatness and that what you talked about that will yeah that uh, this is something that I've shared with my granddaughter who was in the fifth grade who was complaining about how difficult her workload was <laughs> right and I used Michael jo I used an example of me seeing something and Michael Jordan I got lucky some kind of way and got kind of like the Spike Lee seats yeah. at Madison Square Garden yeah. when the Bulls were there. And it was towards the end of the quarter. Right. And I mean, when I say towards the end, like, you know, point something seconds on the clock. Yeah. And somebody, somebody uh, uh, threw a brick and it, cl I mean, it clanged off. Yeah. And every single competitor on the floor relaxed because the buzzer was just getting ready to sound. Right. And Jordan made a breakneck sprint for the ball and flipped it back towards the basket. Yeah. Nowhere close. Right. But I saw something in that moment yeah. that was 
much a part of what separated him from everybody else. Yeah, never, never. You always play, not only just play to the clock, but just be smart. Yeah. You know, and it's just a combination of knowing what to do, situation, moment, all of that. He just excelled at all of those things. It doesn't mean he was a, you know, he was a great three-point shooter, but again, see, the rules were different. People didn't shoot threes back then. Yeah. yeah. So what I tell people is, are you telling me that if Michael Jordan was playing in an era where the three-pointer was important, he wouldn't have been a great three-point shooter? <laughs> mm-hmm. He didn't shoot it because he didn't have to. Mm-hmm. But if he had to, he would have been great at that too. So, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, he was always a step ahead of everybody in terms of knowing what the situation called for in, yeah. in a given game. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, um, I have not followed sports in the last years yeah. as, I, as I once did. Sure. Uh, but I've got some, man, some memories etched. And I want to ask you about this. In terms of single-game performances of the game you love most, basketball, yeah, yeah. Magic Johnson as a rookie. Yeah. That 42-point, what, 15? 15, 15 rebounds. 15 rebounds. Nine assists. Seven, ten, nine. Yeah, something like that. Nine yeah. assists game. Yeah. Playing center because Kareem's out. Uh, Alcindor, uh, 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 Jabbar out. could not. Right, right, right. How does that rank in terms of individual games in, in, in the NBA? Well, just in all honest candor, that was a little before I started covering the league, but I, obviously that's one of the greatest performances of all time. I mean, you, again, the time. A rookie. Yeah, for, you know, the, the time, the, the, the situation, yeah. you know, going without your MVP, yeah. on the road, yeah. you know, against a great Philadelphia team. Yeah. Um, Point guard posting up. Yeah, yeah, I mean, just doing everything. And, again, Magic was – Whew, magic was good. <laughs> magic was really good. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the great ones of all time. I always tell people the greatest defensive performance I ever saw was on Mother's Day in 1993. John Starks was playing against Michael Jordan, and it was, it was the best. Def- I'm, not, I'm not kidding. John Starks played almost a perfect game defensively against Michael Jordan. Mm-hmm. He did everything you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. He was aggressive. He was physical. He beat him to spots. He put his hands up. He mirrored him. He followed him. He went through screens. He trailed him. He did everything right. And Jordan scored 54. <laughs> 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 uh, I, I think Jordan has impressed you. Yeah. <laughs> so you spent Four years at the Philadelphia Inquirer. I did, yeah, yeah. And so, obviously, during that time, mm-hmm. you got to see someone that you obviously were aware of and saw before then mm-hmm. at Georgetown. Oh, Alan, Alan oh sure, I, yeah. Alan, Alan Iverson. Yeah, yeah, I saw Alan. What, he came back at the end because he mm-hmm. had gone to, I think it was Detroit then. Mm-hmm. Um, but he came, they brought him back, mm-hmm. basically, for a victory lap. Mm-hmm. And he played the rest of that year. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I've always gotten along. Alan and I have always gotten along. Um, he is a remarkable competitor. I think his compete is what kept him mm-hmm. in the league at a, at, at a high level. There aren't many more people who compete harder than he does. Mm-hmm. Um, his willingness to sacrifice his body, to throw himself into traffic, to take the hit. I mean, he's, he's got a toughness that is off the chart, mm-hmm. off the charts. Mm-hmm. So I, I really enjoy watching him compete. Mm-hmm. Didn't mean he always won, but right. he competed yeah, yeah. every minute he was on the floor. Yeah. Um, and really, you know, took the Sixers to a high level while he was in his prime. He was a, a great competitor that, and he's one of those guys, 20 years from now, people are going to look at his numbers and his shooting percentage all that and say, he's not, he wasn't that good. Uh-huh. But you had to be there to watch him compete, Yeah, you know, to get the most out of the teams that he was on. Um, that's what made him a great, great player. And I, I always enjoyed watching him play. Mm-hmm. Uh, folks who have a little age on them yeah. would certainly remember um, Morgan Wooten. Sure. The, the, the coach at the math. Yeah. You know, do you think it's way far beyond the pale for those p- folks who say that in terms of being a coach, putting a team on the floor, mm-hmm. uh, motivation, X's and O's, mm-hmm. that Morgan Wooten ranks among the greats who've ever done it? Oh, I think that's... No, I think that's absolutely correct. I mean, Coach Wooten was always um, 
the thing that I always admired about him was he has an incredible decency to him as a human being, first mm -hmm. and foremost. Mm -hmm. And so there's a real, a real humility with Morgan mm -hmm. um, that's not fake, yeah. like a lot of coaches who pretend to be yeah. humble and really aren't. He really is yeah. humble, a humble guy. Um, and yeah, no, I mean, the numbers speak for themselves. I was just at the Hall of Fame up in Springfield um, a couple of weeks ago for the induction ceremony. And, um, you know, he's got a whole section in the Hall of Fame, in the coaches section, yeah. you know, the best coaches ever. Yeah. Because those are the math teams, and I was there with Adrian Branch and guys like that. Um, the preparation was there, but mm -hmm. also the ability to to continue to compete when the game's over and you've yeah. lost yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. or to come back and win. I mean, he, he always, they always played at a very high level and you mm -hmm. had to be a special team to beat them. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Now I was, I was at one of those games. I was up in Baltimore when they played Dunbar. <laughs> yeah. with Dunbar team with Muggsy and David Wingate and Reggie Lewis. Yeah. Woo, yeah. It's the best yeah. team I ever saw. Yeah. Um, but, the math the teams always play very hard, very physical, very smart. Yeah. And that's a testament to the coaching they got. Yeah, and his high school coach. Yeah. He remained a high school coach yeah. throughout yeah. as the Wizard of Westwood. Yeah. John Wooden remained a college coach right. throughout. And there seemed to be, you know, because I mean, that's when I was really, really like maniacal. Yeah, and, sure. And about high school sports, about college sports, man. And, yeah. Uh, and John Wooten, they seem to be twins of sorts. I think this probably, I mean, there may be some, some truth. I know Morgan talked about John Wooten a lot as a kind of a role model for him, mm. you know. But, yeah, there, there's no question. And, we, again, we were blessed to be up, grow up in an era here in D.C. in this area where you had Morgan, you had Joe Deaton Davidson, you had yeah. Bob Wade over at Dunbar. You had yeah. so many great coaches yeah. in the area over a long period of time, Bob mm -hmm. Hedden and all the rest of them. Mm -hmm. um, so you got to see really great, great basketball. Absolutely. And that's what kind of fueled my passion for the game was yeah. that you could go, whether it was an inner high game or Catholic league game, uh -huh. or you were going to see some good or the basketball. Summer, or, the, or, or the summer league. In, including the summer yeah, league Yeah, you go to Jellif or you go to yeah. Urban Coalition, Ur whatever Urban it Coalition. is, you yeah. would see something great. Yeah, yeah. first time I ever saw uh, Julius Irving. Is that right? Was, <laughs> that, was that with that Urban Coalition? Yeah, 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 yeah. World be free. Yeah, People sure. were talking about him. You know, ah, yeah. so world be free what? Man, he came down and just jumped all the yeah, way out of McDonald's. Yeah, dropped about 60 and went home. <laughs> yeah. yeah, jumped <laughs> out, of, out of McDonald's. Yeah. yeah. So, so, I'm... Googling you, yeah. And some kind of way, it flipped, uh, 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 popped up on my screen. It was a uh, highlight reel, not of you. Okay. <laughs> the the other note that James Brown said is, you know, he didn't have a whole lot of athletic skills. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, well, then he's being honest. <laughs> <laughs> but but of of Steph Curry. Yeah. And so so this morning. 4.30 a.m., mm -hmm. I'm watching with the sound mostly down, Yeah. but a 20, a 20 of Steph Curry's uh, greatest highlights. Uh -huh. Curry is probably my favorite player yeah. in, in the NBA, and he does things that are borderline impossible. Yeah. I mean, it's beyond Globetrotter stuff. But he does them, and he does them not just wildly, with, but with a particular authority. Yeah. Your thoughts about Steph Curry as, as a player? Well, he's changed the game. Yeah. He's changed the NBA game forever. The NBA game used to be played somewhere around the three-point line. Went out to the three-point line, maybe a little above the three-point line, but you knew where the, 12, where the 10 players were going to be most of the time mm -hmm. on the basketball court. Well, he has completely flipped the script on that. And the geometry of basketball is different now mm -hmm. because literally 35 feet from the basket, if you aren't, if you don't have a hand up, yeah. it's going up and it's going in. Yeah. And so that completely changes defenses. It, the ability for the five defenders to kind of play off of one another mm -hmm. is, he's Spreading, ended that a total He's spreading of ended the floor. that yeah, yeah 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 and so you can't and then, and then if you combine that with the rules you can't guard them 
Mm -hmm. You can't guard the Warriors mm -mm. <laughs> as they're currently constituted. Right. You have to hope they miss. That's really <laughs> all you can do because right. you can't guard them yeah. <laughs> because of Steph's ability to stretch the floor and his ability to finish in traffic. Mm -hmm. That's what the truly great players, is, as I'm sure you know, the thing that to me offensively separates the truly great players from the other ones is their ability to finish in traffic. They get hit, doesn't matter, they make the shot. Mm -hmm. they, th they go up, somebody's six inches tall, it doesn't matter, they get a shot over them and it goes mm -hmm. in. So the ability for great players, and Steph is a great finisher, mm -hmm. great, mm -hmm. not good, great mm -hmm. finisher at the rim, is what separates him from, I think, everybody else in the league. And then you add the ball handling and all of that other stuff, which he's excelled at. But it starts with his ability to separate defenders from one another. Yeah which makes it impossible to guard as a team defensively. Yeah. Staying on his game for just a minute, uh, when Steve Francis was with the Houston Rockets, yeah. I, had, uh, I had the good fortune of spending a good amount of time traveling with them, yeah. with Calvin Murphy. Mm -hmm. Calvin Murphy, who had built his wrist, best free slow shooter right. ever, right. Uh, uh, had built his wrist through baton, baton twirling. Right, yeah. In, watching this highlight film, whether it was the shooting or whether it was the no-look passes yeah. from an extended position, right. it seems like this dude has, like, steroids in his wrists, man. Very strong. He's got he's strong core, and, he's, and, he, and he, his hands aren't big, yeah. but he can control the ball in a way that few people his size can. Steve Nash could do it, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Steve doesn't have huge hands, but his hands, I think, are bigger than mm -hmm. Steph's. But mm -hmm. Steph... And that's a lot of that's a lot of practice, a lot of ball handling practice, a lot of not just ball handling, but mo uh, to your point, strengthening your wrist so that you can make this yeah. pass, yeah. Um, which is difficult for someone his size usually to be able mm -hmm. to make. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, no, he's put a ton of work in. You can tell, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but you always got to come back with something. Sure, you got to go in the lab and come back with something every yeah. summer, and every yeah. summer he comes back with something different. Yeah. So, David, you, you wrote a piece, um, as said, David Augs at home in D.C., covering, uh, covering the home uh, and city that I love. Yeah. Um, and in it, um, and I just got in my ear here, we only have about four minutes left. I cannot believe this is going this fast. <laughs> um, but in it, you referenced to the Washington's professional football team several times. Yeah. And you refer to them as the skins. Yeah. Is that... Is that a conscious effort not to say Redskins? Yes. Give me your thoughts on that. Well, it's, it's look, I, I've been following them since I was five years old, okay? <laughs> and I had the lunchbox and the poncho and yeah. everything. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's been a, it's the first team I fell in love with mm -hmm. um, back in the George Allen days. But over the course of time, as you talk to people, as you hear the, words of Native Americans, mm -hmm. and they tell you about the harm that this word does to their children mm -hmm. in terms of self-esteem, in terms of their belief that they are really part of this country. You have, I mean, I was affected by that. Mm -hmm. And so it was my decision, and, it, and our policy at The Athletic is that every writer can make whatever decision they want about that word. Mm -hmm. I will choose not to use it. Mm -hmm. I cannot guarantee, I told somebody else this, I cannot guarantee you that I will never, it will never appear in any column that I write, mm -hmm. but it's not gonna be very often. Because mm -hmm. I just, if I can avoid it, I'm going to avoid it. Just because I think I have to be, I have to have some empathy for people who are impacted by that word. I'm not impacted by that word. I'm not Native American. Yeah. So, but other people are, and you have to have some sensitivity to that as a human being. Mm -hmm. You've had this journey uh, as a sports journalist. Yeah. You have two boys. I do. How old? 14? 14 and 11. Four, yeah. 14 and 11. Yeah. Would you want them, uh, would you invite them to follow this path? If they want, sure. If they yeah. want to be a writer, a sports writer, it's a great profession. I love it. It's been great to me. I've enjoyed every minute of it. Um, if they want to be a lawyer or a botanist, that's fine too. Um, uh, they are, they both love sports and you know, if they want to be involved in it in some way, I'm going to support them a thousand percent. Uh, so to be able to come back 
uh, I've read it. Yeah. And if you could share it in the last 90 seconds that we have to right. be able to come back now and to be home home, yeah. which is probably towards, you know, the end of your professional yeah. time. Yeah. Tell us what that means. Well, it means everything because, you know, I, 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 I've been here my whole life. Mm -hmm. I mean, other than two years when I was lived in Bethesda, I've lived in the city my whole life. Mm -hmm. um, I'm from D.C. I grew up in D.C. Um, everything I've gotten out of life I got because I lived here, mm -hmm. you know, all, and so it's, it's a special place to me. And I think the, the sports scene in D.C. has reached a certain level of maturity where it's not just about what the football team does, and that's the only thing that anybody cares about. Yeah. I mean, now you've got the, the Caps winning the Stanley Cup. You've got the Nats in the playoffs most of the time. Mm -hmm. The Wizards have been in the playoffs the last several years. The Mystics were in the NBA final or the WNBA finals. So, and Maryland's always a big story. So there's a lot of sports that people are interested in and passionate about. Mm -hmm. And so it's exciting to me to see that growth and to and I wanted to cover it I wanted to be a part of it you know because this is home and I wanted I want to see these teams and how they do and I want to spend more time with my family that's mm -hmm. the bottom line mm -hmm. it's time there uh, a lot of folks don't know it yet but there's a there's going to be an emerging power Mm. and it's called the Howard University Football Bison. There you go. So we're going we're gonna to be calling you down at Absolutely. the Athletic. We already wrote a story on, on uh, Cam's brother, so it's in there. Go All right. Yeah, it's in there. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining yes, us. Yes, sir. Man. My pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you. Got to come back. Absolutely. Good deal. All right. Folks, thank you for joining us this evening. For more information on this program or any other program produced by WHUT, go to WHUT.org. Goodbye, and may God bless you. This program was produced by WHUT, Howard University Television, and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.